The Wood Whisperer is sponsored by Powermatic and Typebond. Have you ever tried to bend a board? It doesn't usually go very well. But in woodworking, we have a couple different ways that we can make this happen. One is bent lamination. And I've actually done a video on this in the past. It's where you take a board, you slice it into thin veneers, put glue between each layer, and then you bend it against a form. And then when the glue dries, it takes the new shape. Uh, the other method is steam bending. That's something that I have never done before. So I needed to make little skis or runners for a small sled for the kids. And I thought this would be a good opportunity to play with steam bending. So I'm gonna get into this for the first time. I'm gonna take you guys on the journey with me. And in some cases, I'm gonna sort of just ignore advice on purpose because I wanna see what the limits of this process are. I wanna see why things break and work my way toward a successful bend. Now, even before I start thinking about the steam box and steam generation, I'm actually thinking about the material that I'm using. Steam bending works better with air dried lumber and I don't have any air dried lumber. All I have is kiln dried. So this is some white oak, which is a good bending species. It just happens to be kiln dried. So from what I've read, you need to kind of pre-treat this stuff a little bit, soften it up a little bit. So that's gonna be step one. We'll resaw to the thickness that we'll use in the project and then we'll make a fancy little bath. Now, the bath for these boards doesn't have to be anything fancy, but if you wanna be efficient about it and you don't wanna use your bathtub in the house or a big tote, which could be wasteful, um, you might consider something like this four inch PVC. If we put an end cap on one end, we could have a very long bath tube that we could fill with our water and allow these guys to sit for as long as we want to. You don't have any evaporation. You can cap off the top if you want to. So that's what we're gonna do. And I'm gonna start with the Sawzall and just kind of cut along this line. Now I've got my end cap here, but I'm gonna flip this guy around and use the factory edge instead of my jacked up edge that I made. Pop this guy on there. And uh, I don't think I really need any cement. These things fit pretty nicely. I don't think it's gonna leak. What do you think? I find your lack of faith disturbing. Now, instead of just adding water, I'm actually gonna put some fabric softener into the water, which will hopefully help soften the fibers. Now, I read about this on two different websites, which by internet standards, that means it's indisputable fact. So we are going to add it at about a half cup per gallon, which I'm pretty sure they just made up. So, you know, a good cap full for two gallons and we'll start adding it to the tube. I don't know if this is gonna work, but at least the shop smells snugly soft. And now I'm just gonna drop all four pieces in. And by the way, I have two thicker pieces at about a half inch and two at a quarter inch. I'm not 100% sure what I'm gonna use in the project yet, but I figured it'd be nice to have both thicknesses to test with. Okay, so we got a floater, of course, in there. The wood is gonna float, so we'll need something to weigh it down. And I guess I don't see anything wrong with using a fire extinguisher. It's gonna fit, it's heavy, and it's even got a hook on it to stop it from going too deep, but you know, the wood is submerged. So how long do we let it sit? I don't know. I'm gonna let it sit overnight, and then I'll do a test tomorrow for my first run. If I get a bad result, then I have three other pieces in here to continue this process with. So we'll see how it goes. Now, while those boards soak, we can make the little steam chamber thing. So uh, we took some outdoor plywood, cut it into roughly six inch strips. They're about four feet long. And we have two end pieces, which will make the back and the door. And I'm gonna pre-drill here because I wanna have some dowels located along the length. These dowels will allow us to put the work high up in the chamber so it gets the advantage of the heat rising and the steam rising. And we'll just span from side to side with these little dowels. So I gotta drill a few more holes here, just make sure they're spaced uh, the same on both side pieces. At the back of the box, we need to drill a half inch hole for this little brass fitting that came with the kit. That's where the steam is going to enter the box. Oh, maybe I need a larger bit. It's a little snug. It's all right, we'll make it work. Very nice. I got the two sides in place. I'm gonna bring the top in, drop it on top. Really nothing fancy here, just screws and no glue. The idea being we could take this apart for storage or to modify it in the future. It's the first time doing this, so I don't know. I'll probably have to make changes at some point. So just uh, countersink, start driving the screws. And before I screw down the second side piece, we will cut some of the dowel stock. Obviously, they're gonna be harder to install if we screw that together now.
So next thing you need to do is attach this piece at the back with the uh, brass fitting in it. This is where the steam is going to come in. So the idea being the steam comes in one side, travels through and kind of stays up and we're going to tilt the box slightly this way. So the steam rises up, condensation goes down and that angle will allow the condensation to go this way and that means we need some kind of a drain hole here at the bottom. Now, as the steam travels through this thing, it needs a place to go. So we will have a front hinged door, but that door is closed all the time. So in order for the steam to escape, we're gonna wind up putting a little hole. And it's pretty nice that this kit came with all this hardware. I'm not sure if they still sell it like that, but at least five years ago they did. All right, before I actually attach these to the side, I almost forgot. Uh, instructions say to put a little bit of a gasket or a weather seal. Oh, look at that. It just shows up. Uh, and this way you got a little bit of an additional seal around the outside. You know me. Any excuse to whip out the knife. <sighs> Scissors. Still not sponsored by Kershaw Blades. Put a little hole for a meat thermometer. Boop. I've got two little support pieces that will be like risers here. Uh, I'm gonna make this side, the side with the door, be a little bit higher. And then this side, the side with the drain hole and where the, uh, the steam comes in, will be like a dis. I think we could uh, use this to maybe like proof bagels. That's how they do it, right? Like a big steam chamber. So we've got soaking boards. We've got a steam chamber ready to go. What we don't have is a bending form. I'll make the form out of some MDF sheet goods. The first piece establishes the desired shape. I'm actually making runners for a kid's pool sled, which is our next project video. So make sure you click that subscribe button and the bell so you don't miss out. The curve is finessed and smoothed. I take the finished piece and use it to make another copy. I need to build up at least three layers to have the thickness that I need for the project parts. With the pieces glued and screwed together, I can flush trim the new piece to match up perfectly. Now for the third piece. So now we're ready to run our first test. We've got the steam chamber set up. The block on the side with the door is just a little bit higher so that we have a bit of an angle this way. Our drain holes are down here. I've hooked up this hose, filled up the little steam generator and plugged it in. And now we wait. All right, so it's been about 15 minutes and we have a nice rolling boil here and steam should start traveling through into the chamber. See that dial moving up. We've just passed the rare beef and smoked ham on our way to poultry. All right, so now I'm gonna grab one of these wonderful smelling pieces of wood. I also heard from a lot of people that on wood this thin, the fabric softener is overkill, but it smells great. Now I really don't know if this is gonna blast me with steam, so just in case I do have gloves on. Glug, 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 glug. Pop this guy in there, close it up. Steam it, baby. Now, generally speaking, they say about an hour per inch of thickness, and we've got a half inch piece, so we're looking at about a half hour. It's a good idea to not shove your hand in there. Don't ask me how I know. All right, ready? Here I come, Jay. All right, start with a clamp here. Try to go in the middle of the workpiece. And uh, one of us will clamp, the other's gonna push. Retighten them as we need. Okay, just put it on there as a placeholder. We'll move to the next one. Well, that wasn't too bad at all. And I think I'll get even better results when I have a narrower piece where it's not higher than the uh, form itself. Uh, but not too bad at all. I mean, at a half inch thick, given that much extra soak time, plus the fabric softener, I think, you know, I wasn't really expecting too much of a problem. So, I might leave this overnight, but I'm gonna start thinking about my actual ski pieces for the sled. Uh, they'll be a full you know, 48 inches in length. So when you're 
picking the material for this sort of bending operation, if you have a slight curve and the pieces are fairly thin, you could be a little bit less worried about grain direction. But if you're doing something that's a much more intense bend, you probably want to pay attention and get some nice straight grain material. So I still have a pretty straight board here. Um, I'm going to take this guy down to about a half inch and then it'll be ready for the bending operation. But thankfully, with this thickness, with this bend, I just don't think we need to worry too much about the grain. We'll see. On this test piece, I'm just going to take the clamps off. And watch over here because uh, whenever you bend wood, regardless of what process you use, there's a phenomenon called spring back where it doesn't stay exactly at the shape that you thought it was going to be and it kind of springs back to be a little bit straighter than you originally wanted. And look at that. That's a pretty significant amount of spring back here. That's almost, uh, almost three quarters of an inch. All right, so this is getting really interesting. As I let this piece sit for a little bit, the spring back increased. And then, putting my hands on this, I can kind of feel the moisture in the board when you feel that uh, cold clamminess. You know there's more moisture in there. So I think I took it out of the form a little bit too soon. So, since I have two of these to do, and I don't want to spend uh, like six days, <laughs> you know, waiting for each one of these to dry and then do the next one, wait for that to dry, um, I think I'm left with the only choice is to make a second form. If I have two forms, I can clamp them both at the same time, and then after maybe a two-day dry time, three if it's necessary, I'll take them out and I should be good to go. Another option would be to actually double the thickness of the form and then use a wider board, bend it all at once, and then after it's dry, bandsaw it down the middle and they're exactly the same and you have your two pieces. The reason I'm not doing that is because I think it's a lot harder to get good even clamping pressure that would keep this piece from sort of cupping and be, be just becoming a little bit wobbly. Um, I think it's much easier for me to clamp a narrow piece. So, I mean, it feels wasteful to use all that sheet stock to do this, but I, I don't see any other way to do this and actually get it done within a reasonable amount of time. So while the first one really didn't leak, I did see a little bit of uh, water pulling at the joint. So I figured this time, let's get some silicone caulk in there because I don't want to go buy any PVC cement and that should do the trick. Yeah, this guy over here. Yeah, that's good, that's good. That's safe. That, yeah, do more of that. There we go. Waste not, want not. All right, so got my two ski pieces, about a half inch thick. I went about two and a quarter inches wide to match my uh, bending form. And we'll let these go overnight. So I went to plug in the steamer for the second round of steaming here, and I noticed a lot of steam and water was coming out the back. Apparently, I don't know when I did it, but I must have dropped something on this because I have a massive crack that goes all the way down into the reservoir. This thing is pretty much unusable at this point. I did try to tape it and see if that would work, but it's just not building the steam pressure that you need to get the box steaming. So. Thankfully, I have a Rockler that's nearby. I was able to go and pick up another unit, but there's just some irony in the fact that I've held on to this thing for almost six years, finally use it, and on its second use, I screw it up and break it. <laughs> so uh, this does have me thinking, though, should I build something for this? I think if I do a lot more steaming in the future, I might get into my own little propane setup um, and, and cobble something together that way that's a little bit more durable and reliable. Uh, but for the amount that I'm doing this at this point, it was worth it to just buy another one and uh, just get this project moving forward. So what are you going to do? I'll put the pieces in a steamer for about 30 to 40 minutes. Jason wasn't around to help me with the clamping this time, so Nicole was kind enough to jump in and help out. Unfortunately, we're moving just a little bit slower than is ideal. You'll see the results in a minute for this bend. On the second bend, I decided to go it alone, which was a really dumb idea. It took me way too long, and as you'll see, the results are no bueno. Well, we definitely have our first failures at this point. I got a lot of checking in the first piece I tried to bend and just an outright split here in the second piece. And these, these are toast at this point. Uh, but you know what? We've got to think about it. We've got to think about why this might have happened. Of course, the wood is sort of an X factor. Sometimes things just aren't going to go your way. Um, but I think in this case, there's one thing that's very different between these pieces and my practice pieces, and that's the amount of time they had to soak. These guys, I gave them well, less than 24 hours. It was just an overnight soak. The other pieces, not intentionally, but because I got so busy with other things, they soaked for about three days. 
And with this kiln dried stock, I think that's making a difference. Could very well be. So what I'm gonna do now is make some extra pieces. That's another lesson learned here, is to not just cut the exact number you need, cut some extra because if you have a failure and you're doing this soaking process, I could already have pieces in here that are now 24 hours soaked and it would save me a lot of time. So this time around, I've got four pieces just in case and I'm gonna drop them in this little soak tank and let them go for a few days. Uh, I don't really trust doing anything sooner than that at this point. Um, so, I mean, this is something we could get upset about. You know, this will definitely put a damper on the day, but ultimately failure is a part of the learning process. Failure equals experience. And the more you fail, the more you find ways to succeed because you've already figured out all the ways to fail. <laughs> that's, a, that's what I'm telling myself. So at this point, we're just gonna dunk these guys in there and we'll see them in a few days. So I am super excited because I just got a little gift from a gentleman named Chris, my new hero, who supplied me with an air dried slab of white oak. Now, I still have my other pieces soaking. I do plan to see how that affects the bend, um, but I think I might push forward with the project using this air dried stock. Now doing some research, it seems some people say when it's an air dried piece, you don't need to do any kind of soak. You just make sure you steam it sufficiently. Uh, other people say you should probably soak it for a little bit to bring the moisture content up, especially if you're in a place like Denver where the general relative humidity is very low, which means the wood isn't gonna have as much moisture in it. So I think I'm gonna go with a good, strong steaming. Um, I have enough material here that I might have a couple of runs to try it out. I don't need much, um, but we're gonna cut it up and see what happens. All right, so before I take this air dried stock and start the steaming process, I'm really going to evaluate what I've done so far and try to improve things. One thing that I've learned is really important is this concept of a backing strap that not only holds the workpiece in place, but it supports the fibers and encourages compression of the fibers. When it comes to wood, wood does not like to necessarily stretch, right? That's when you get those splits and breaks, but it can compress. So a strap like this with blocks on the ends that actually go right up against the workpiece, as you're bending it, and this piece wants to get a little bit longer, this compression strap is holding everything in and causing the wood to compress and not stretch. And this is kind of a mainstay of steam bending. So it was just one of those things where I wanted to see what I could get away with. And apparently I can't get away with much. So I decided to make the compression strap. Also made a few modifications to my forms, including a 90 degree angle where I need a little bit more clamping pressure and then changing this back angle so it's perfectly parallel with the front bend angle. And that'll allow me to get the clamps in place. All right, so very quickly, let me show you how I made this little compression strap. All I needed were some hardwood scraps for the ends, a couple lengths of rolled steel strap material, and some nuts and bolts. The design for this compression strap is roughly modeled after the one in Lon Schleining's book, Wood Bending Made Simple. Look for the Amazon link in the description if you'd like to pick up a copy. I highly recommend it. On one end, we use the hardwood to sandwich the two straps and lock them in place. To make the straps easier to work with and to protect the wood, I'm putting a layer of packing tape across the surface. Now the length of the strap is customized for this project, so I'll drop in one of my work pieces and use it to locate the block at the other end. And that's our compression strap. So before I throw these guys into the steam chamber, I'm gonna take my block plane and just ease that sharp corner. Now I don't know if this is really gonna work, but somebody on Instagram told me about this and they said it does help prevent splits from starting. And uh, who am I to argue? All right, so I'm gonna give these a little bit more time than the last one. Maybe we'll go for 40 minutes, an hour, or however long it takes me to eat lunch. Now I really feel like I'm doing this properly. Air dried lumber, a little extra steaming time, a compression strap, this better work. After the piece cools, we remove it from the form and transfer it to a second form where the piece can dry. This frees up the compression strap and we can move on to the second piece. All right, so these things have been in the forms for about two days now. They spent a good portion of that time in front of my fireplace. Uh, not right up on it, but a little bit behind, so I figure it's 
a good way for it to get a little bit of extra heat and it might help the wood dry a little bit faster. So hopefully that's enough time for these things to be set in their shape. So we are going to remove the clamps and see what we've got. Okay. That looks pretty decent. So when I put the piece up against the form, I could see how much spring back we got and it is no more than a half inch, so that's not bad at all. And if you recall, we cut this form a little bit more to account for spring back. And that's about as much as I removed, was like a half inch. So I think we are right on target at this point. And although we are concerned about how much spring back we get, the most important thing on this project is not so much the exact angle that we take on here, but the fact that these two are going to be the same, right? Because if these are two runners on a sled and are totally different, it's not gonna work very well. So when I put these two together, there's a slight difference between them, but there's enough flex in here that we should have no problem getting these to do exactly what we need them to do. So yeah, air dried, not so bad. All right, so because I can't leave well enough alone, I still have some kiln dried material that has been soaking. And I really wanna see if I bend that now, will I have any better luck than I did before? That's where I had my big split. So we're gonna take the two forms, even though I have the work pieces already. I just wanna see, are those easier to bend? Uh, I'll check them after we bend them and see, is there any kind of cracking? Just another data point for me to understand a little bit more about this process. Now these kiln dried pieces had several days to soak and I could really feel how waterlogged they are. But we bent them both and let them dry for several days. You'll see the results here in a minute. So now that I have a couple of successful bends behind me and I need to move on to other things, I'm gonna draw some initial conclusions about the results that I saw. Um, you know, if you're experienced in steam bending or you talk to an old you know, pro who's been doing this forever, some of this may be common sense to those people. But the reason I go through this process is to prove to myself, not just accept other people's word for it, but prove to myself what's necessary, what's not, what has an impact and what doesn't. So first conclusion I've come to is that with air dried material, I don't necessarily think the soaking makes a whole lot of difference. I had pieces that weren't soaked and they bend just the same as pieces that soaked for several days with fabric softener. The only real difference is the pieces that soaked were more waterlogged, which means they take longer to dry. The process takes that much longer. And I think if you introduce that much water, you do have potential for things to maybe go wrong, right? It just is another variable that doesn't need to be there. So in the future with air dried lumber, I don't think I would go through any type of soaking process. Now, some of this may certainly depend on the condition of the wood, the moisture content that you receive it in, air dried can be all over the map, that warrants further investigation. But at least initially, I'm gonna say that the water soak doesn't really seem to do a whole lot, at least it didn't for me. Now, the next thing would be steaming. Um, I don't know if it's elevation, you know, we're in Denver here, so the high elevation may be a factor, I don't know. But it seemed like I have to steam a little bit longer than what the literature generally recommends. So that is, again, something depending on where you live, the effectiveness of your steam box and how much steam you're able to actually get in there. These are all factors and variables that are kind of hard to predict. Um, so for me, I just found a longer steam time was a little bit more effective. Now I know plenty of people do bends without a compression strap, but from what I've seen, it looks like a necessity. I don't think I would attempt a steam bend in the future without one. It made a huge difference. In fact, it made it possible. The bends were just not working out until I started using the compression strap. Now dry time, that's something that I really would like to do more research on. Uh, do test pieces and make everything else the same. The only thing that changes is how long it dries in the clamps in a warm environment. Uh, does 24 hours give more spring back than a 48 hour, you know, or a four day, five day, uh, you know, time in the clamps. Um, so I can't really say a whole lot about that other than the fact that I would give my pieces at least 24 hours in a nice dry and warm area, preferably really warm, like in front of a fireplace or something or a room that you could put a space heater and keep it nice and warm in there. Now let's talk about kiln dried wood. That is where some of the most surprising results were and where I guess some of the most cautionary tales are gonna come from with my experience here. Let me show you some of the damage I'm looking at. Now you've already seen this piece. This is one of the first kiln dried pieces that wound up splitting. We had a really big break on that one. But if you look along this face, you should see these stress fractures. And it's all the way down the piece, even on the straightaway, okay, where there really wasn't a whole lot of pressure applied, we have these fractures here. That's really concerning. Now, if you look at a piece that was soaked a little bit longer and then given the bend, it didn't break. You know, we were able to get a successful bend, but look at the condition of the surface. And this is at the bend. Again, look at the straightaway. 
right? It's got all of these little stress fractures in there. And you even see them on the inside as well. So while the soak does seem to be necessary to get a bend that doesn't just split and break, it does introduce another variable with that additional moisture. And the loss of that moisture over the course of a couple days creates all this checking in the surface. I'm still trying to figure this one out. I know people do successful bends with kiln dried material all the time, but all I can tell you is right now with these particular boards, no matter how long I soaked or how short I soaked, I wind up with this checking in the surface, right? Now I've also taken some boards that were kiln dried and soaked for days. These were just loaded with moisture. I didn't get a chance to bend these. They were just test pieces that I, I didn't actually bend. These have not checked. So it's the process of the compression strap and the bend, whatever that does to the wood causes that checking. And it doesn't seem to do it in the air dried material, whether it was soaked or not, right? It's just the kiln dried. Initial observations for me, I, I do think I've come to the conclusion that if I'm gonna do this again, I'm just, I'm gonna have to find air dried material. There's just too many variables. It's too difficult for someone who doesn't do this all the time to get the kiln dried stuff to work with this application. So spoiler alert, here's what those runners are going to become. This is the little sled that I made for my kids and that'll be our next project video. Now, if you have suggestions for resources, any tips from your experiences about steam bending, please go ahead and leave them in the comments. And while you're there, why don't you give this video a like if you enjoyed it and subscribe. I don't usually ask for that kind of stuff, but hey, we're here, why not? Let's do it. Um, I also have a suggestion for you guys. This is a book I've had on my shelf for a long time. It's Wood Bending Made Simple by Lon Schleining, and it covers not just steam bending, but also bent lamination and a couple other methods. It's a really good resource. I use this multiple times throughout this process to kind of just be a foundation when I need to just up my game a little bit and go to that next level, learning about compression straps and all that stuff. So you can get this on Amazon. All right, so thanks for watching everybody. We'll catch you next time.